so this is Physics 1C for uh, May 7th. Um, today what we're going to be talking about is energy in a magnetic field and oscillations in a circuit. Uh, thanks for telling me that I wasn't sharing the screen. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, yesterday we talked about inductors. As a reminder, inductors are coils of wire. Um, the symbol for an inductor in a circuit is this. The inductance of the inductor is measured with the symbol L. If I have a simple circuit like this where you have uh, an EMF source, a resistor, an inductor, we said yesterday that there's a way in which you can look at the loop rule, that is to say Kirchhoff's loop rule, by going around the circuit in this direction. When you pass the EMF, you get E. I don't know how well you guys remember this. When you walk past the, when you go past the resistor, you're going to get uh, a voltage drop of I, IR. And then when you come past the inductor, this is what we learned yesterday, you get this expression. Negative L di dt. This expresses the voltage drop across the inductor. The inductor acts as a way to describe what happens in the circuit when the current increases. It does nothing if the current is constant. This is what I represents as the current. When the current is constant, the inductor does nothing. But while the current is trying to increase, the inductor has a back EMF that pushes back on that and resists your attempts to instantaneously turn the current on or off. And it uh, effectively makes it so that the circuit responds sluggishly or slowly to changes in current. And that was the, the kind of relationship we used yesterday to start off uh, uh, talking about this. What we're going to do today, though, is talk about energy and how you can store energy inside one of these inductors. So the next thing we want to do is to multiply both sides of this equation uh, by I, the current, basically. And we're going to get uh, IE and then I squared R and then um, this term will be basically Li. DIDT. All that's equal to zero. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add these terms here so we get an expression like that. Actually, that's not so important that I do that. We'll just write it like that. And then I'm going to say, let's look at each of these terms right here. What does that term represent? If I take the current that's flowing in the circuit, and maybe I should have indicated the current in the circuit would be you know, something that we call I. If I take the current that flows through the circuit and I multiply by the EMF of the battery, what does I times E give me? Do you guys remember? Okay, if you don't, we can come back to that one. What about this one? Does that look familiar to you? What does I squared R represent? power, right? It would be, I think we've said before, it's like the power kind of dissipated by the resistor, right? Or the rate at which energy is kind of flowing out of the resistor. But it's power, for sure. Specifically, it's power in terms of the resistor. How quickly the resistor is using up energy, or the energy being delivered to the resistor, whatever you want to call it. What's IE then? It's also a type of power, but what would it be in this case? Yeah, this is basically the power, exactly, it's the power output of the source, you might call it, or the EMF source, right? So if that's the power output of the source, and that power goes into the resistor, and then maybe it also goes into the inductor too, right? This would be basically the power, or the, uh, I'm going to say it in a different way, because power is basically a rate of energy. So I'm going to say this is the rate of energy storage in the magnetic field of the inductor. So I'll just say B fields of our inductor. Right? And, and in a way, we could write that like this. We could say that the term Li, that was kind of ugly, Li uh, di dt, since it's a type of power, if we defined the energy that's stored if we define the energy that's stored inside of the um, in, uh, inductor to be U, then this is effectively something like this. So U represents the energy okay, it's the energy in the inductor. 
Does that expression make sense to you guys if I say that? This is the rate of energy storage then, so that's why we say it's du dt. It's the rate of change of energy um, within that, uh, that inductor. Notice that this quantity could be positive, negative, or zero, right? Because di dt is a, is a quantity that says what's happening to the current. Is the current increasing or decreasing in your circuit? Like when you turn it on, the current's increasing, right? So this is positive. Would you guys agree? Does that make sense? When you turn the circuit on, I don't want to write all this out. I could type it or something, but when I turn the circuit on, this quantity is positive. Do you guys agree? Does that make sense? That means that the inductor is, is having energy sent into it, basically, right? When, this, when, the, when you try to turn the circuit off, though, this quantity is negative, right? This is... God, I can't catch it. There, this thing's getting in the way. We're just going to push it off the side because I don't care. Um, when this quantity here... Uh, sorry. When you turn the circuit off, this quantity would be negative, right? And that would mean that the rate at which energy was being stored in the conductor is negative, which effectively means that it's losing energy. But what happens is that that energy that it loses, it sends right back into the circuit. So it basically makes it so the current won't shut off instantly. It takes some time for the magnetic field that's produced inside of the inductor to decay. Because in the system, once you have current flowing in it, you effectively have magnetic field lines. Let me see if I draw this right, see if it's that way. The current's flowing that way, and it's, it depends on how these things are coiled, but you have a magnetic field inside of this inductor here. Once the current's flowing. When you try to turn the circuit off, and DIDT is a negative number, then the magnetic field decays, and the process of that decay of the magnetic field sends energy back into the system and makes it so the current doesn't instantly stop. Did you guys follow all of that? When you turn the circuit on, the magnetic field builds up. When you turn the circuit off, the magnetic field decays. The building up of the magnetic field is a, is, is a rate of energy storage, it's energy being stored in the magnetic field. And then when you turn the circuit off, the magnetic field decays, but it sends energy back into the circuit. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? you have any questions about that? Did I go through that too fast? You turn the circuit on, you store energy in the field, you turn it off, the field gives you energy and stores it back in. So when this quantity, du dt, ends up being a positive number, you have a question? Sorry, someone's saying something. No? Okay. All right, so if u is the energy stored in the inductor, right, and this expression tells us what that is, we can kind of get rid of the dt's here, and we can say that um, now, uh, L, I, di should be equal to du, and if we integrate this from the point when zero energy is stored up to some whatever energy, u prime, and we do it from zero current in the system up to some i prime, then the left-hand side of the equation, since the inductance L is a constant, is going to become this, one-half Li squared, technically i prime squared, and the right-hand side is going to become u prime. But then we get rid of the primes because they're like dummy indices. And what we're left with is, um, oh no, wrong color. Those two look really the same. Uh, we get this. This represents the energy that gets stored. Okay. Well, it's this, basically. It's the energy in the inductor. I don't need to write it twice. More specifically, it's the energy stored in the magnetic field of the inductor. It's the magnetic field of the inductor that stores this energy right here. And the amount of energy that's stored is given by one half the inductance times the current squared. Does that make sense? I like to think that this is a way of like, it stores the kinetic energy of the charges in a way, you know? Because the current is effectively related to the rate at which the charges are moving. And once the magnetic field's set up, in a way, there's this, this energy that's stored. Uh, one half Li squared. It's, it's a type of energy that's stored in the motion of the charges, right? And since it's an energy that's stored in the motion of the charges, it's like an energy that's related to kind of like the kinetic energy of the charges. Does that make sense? Um, you can see how this is very similar to this expression. Right? Uh, the, the kinetic energy in, in mechanics. This looks really similar. I told you guys yesterday that the most, uh, the best analogy for inductance in... Um, uh, mechanics is that inductance is very similar to mass 
in the sense that the, the larger the number of coils you have in the system, the more sluggish the system is to changes in current. If you think about that in terms of mass, um, the larger an object is, the more the, the more sluggish it is in response to changes in velocity. That's what inertia is, right? You try to shake something that's really massive, you're going to notice that it's uh, harder to shake than like a, a tissue paper or something like that. Things that have mass, like bowling balls, they're hard to shake back and forth. They're hard to swing back and forth because if you try to change their velocities, uh, you're going to feel a huge amount of resistance. It's not because of their weight, it's because they have mass. You would feel that same amount of resistance even if you're on the moon, right? So inductance is very similar to mass. Current is very similar to velocity, and the energy stored in, a, in, in, in the energy stored in the magnetic field of an inductor is, in very many senses, kind of like kinetic energy. It's very similar to kinetic energy. It's like the energy of the charges. Once they have that energy, you can't instantly stop them from moving in the same way that you couldn't jump out in front of a dump truck and then instantly stop it from moving. You know what I mean? Uh, it would take a huge amount of force to instantly stop a dump truck from moving, and even if you did, it would bounce off the wall, uh, whatever you. you you tried to stop it with, right? So, <clears throat> yeah. That's the energy stored in an inductor. Do you guys have any questions? There's a lot of talking. It's all very conceptual so far. So, we can look at a specific example of how this works. And by specific, I mean, let's look at a solenoid. And let's actually calculate the energy in a solenoid. So according to this expression, you have to take the inductance of the solenoid times the current squared and divide by two, right? Um, we, we looked, we saw yesterday what the inductance of a solenoid was. Um, you calculate inductance by doing this calculation here. I guess we could do the derivation again. It's pretty simple. Inductance is defined as the number of turns in the, the coils multiplied by the flux divided by the current. And we said, okay, well, in a solenoid, the flux is going to be the magnetic field times the area of the solenoid multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the area and the magnetic field. Let's assume they're parallel. You divide by the current I, and then we say, okay, in a magnetic field of a solenoid, the magnetic field of a solenoid is given by this expression. Uh, it's mu naught times uh, the number of turns per unit length multiplied by the current flowing through the system divided by I. And once you cancel out the two I's here, you end up getting that the inductance of a solenoid, right? We're going to talk about energy, but we're, we're rederiving something we need now. The inductance of the solenoid ends up being equal to, what is it, mu naught times uh, n squared divided by the length of the solenoid multiplied by the current flowing through it. No, 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 that canceled. It's just that. Oh, times a, I left out the a right here, my bad. There's an a sitting over right here yeah, times the area. It's entirely dependent on all those factors, none of them having to do with the current. It's entirely dependent on the shape of the, the object, basically. So right here we know now that the energy stored in a solenoid is given by that, right? So let's, uh, let's, let's you know, use this and, and plug it up here for L. So then the energy in stored in a solenoid, right, would be 1 half. You'd use L, which we just wrote right here. So mu naught, uh, number of turns squared, divided by the length times the area. And then you now you have to multiply by current squared, right? Now for the current squared, what we're going to do is say the magnetic field of a solenoid, we use it over here is just uh, mu naught times n over l i. But that means that the current that's flowing in the solenoid is directly related to the magnetic field as, what is it going to be? It's going to be v times l divided by n mu naught, right? So if we plug that in here, So I squared is going to be V squared, L squared, divided by uh, N squared, U naught. Wait, is the N supposed to cancel out like this? One of the L's does. No, this looks fine. Yeah, this looks fine. So now our one of these N squareds cancel. The mu naught, oh, I left something out. Everything here was squared. We had to square the I, so everything here is squared. So then the mu naughts cancel, like one of them cancels. And one of the lengths cancels. And what we're left with is the energy stored in the solenoid ends up being it's V squared divided by 2 mu naught times A times L. And just to remind... 
sometimes I forget I should draw these things every time. To remind you what a solenoid is, a solenoid is basically a whole bunch of coils, right, that have some length L, and the area of the end cap is A, so that's the area here is A. So if I take A times L, what does that represent for my solenoid? What's A times L for the solenoid? It's the volume of the solenoid, right? So this expresses the energy stored in the magnetic field. But it turns out that we can express it in an even more general way if we do this. If we take the energy stored in the solenoid and we divide by the volume of the solenoid, we get this expression, which is very general. That if you want to find the energy per unit volume for a magnetic field, it's given by B squared divided by 2 mu naught. This is essentially the energy stored. Now, this is, this is something where I probably should change how I write these U's. I want to write a little cursive subscript view or something. I don't know how you want to put this. But this basically represents the energy density of the magnetic field. This is something that's going to be very important to us later when we start talking about uh, light, uh, electromagnetic radiation. This is the energy density of uh, the magnetic field. Or a magnetic field, I should say. We derived it just for a solenoid, but you could try the same thing for other configurations and you get the same answer. This is a very general statement that if you want to find the energy density of a magnetic field, that's the energy per unit volume. Like you can see what it represents right here. This is volume. The energy per unit volume is the magnetic field squared divided by 2 mu naught. And mu naught is really just a constant. So effectively, you can say that the energy in the magnetic field is b squared over 2. <clears throat> it's proportional to b squared. All right. Do you guys have any questions about that? We're specifically going to look at an application where we can use this, which is called the LC circuit. That's kind of the main topic we're going to discuss today. Okay, is that all good with you guys? I went through that relatively fast, I feel like, but there's two big topics here, I guess. Uh, we derived this one yesterday. We did it again today. Um, that's the energy stored in the inductor, and here's the energy stored in the magnetic field per unit volume, so it's energy density. Do you guys have any questions at all about all this stuff before I move on to something else, and I'll wait for a second. Okay, so moving right along. The next thing we want to talk about is um, an LC circuit. So, an LC circuit is a circuit that contains an L, which is an inductor, and a C, which is a capacitor. And it's really simple. Um, the one we're going to do with, the one that we're going to work with is going to be like this. We're going to start off the capacitor that carries some charge. We're going to put a switch in here. And then we're going to have an inductor. So this is our inductor L. This is our capacitor C. We're going to start off with, oh, I don't know which side. I guess this side. Positive and this side negative. They will each carry the same amount of charge. That charge we're going to call capital Q. And then we're going to say that um, at t equal to zero, the switch is, is the, we're going to flip the switch down here. So the switch is going to then be connected like this. And we're going to kind of investigate what happens on our system here. Okay. So what's going to happen? If I close that switch, what's going to happen here? I showed you guys a kind of demo of this yesterday or a, like an applet or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> um, what's going to happen? Yeah, so after some time... Um, what's going to happen is that, uh, and I'm going to draw a few pictures of this, but it's, you know, after a little bit of time has passed here, there's going to be charges on here. There just aren't going to be as many. Let's say it's Q. Not as many over here. We've got a few charges. Um, but now there's going to be current flowing through the system. And the fact that there's current flowing through the system, and here let's, um, let's not call it capital I, let's call it, faster just to erase that, I guess. Um, so we got our inductor. 
there's some current I that flows through the system, and then it flows through here, and while it's flowing, there's going to be a magnetic field here. Probably that direction, right? The current's flowing that way. I guess it depends on how the coils are oriented, but something like that. And then we can say that in this scenario right here, you have a combination of an electric field and a magnetic field. There's current flowing, and there's charges that are stored up here. Oh, wait, not magnetic field. This is an electric field, my bad. There's charges that are stored on the plates. So we can say that there's energy stored in the capacitor, right? I don't know if you guys remember this, but you can define the energy stored in a capacitor uh, by doing this. You take the charge squared, and you divide by 2 times C. You can do the same thing down here. We saw that there's the energy stored in an inductor, which can be given by 1 half Li squared. That's what we just talked about a second ago. When we combine these two things together here, we can say that if we take, if we want to find the total energy of the system, we can say that it's equal to the charge, the energy stored in the capacitor plus the energy that's stored in the inductor. And in this case, that total energy is going to be equal to, at a moment in time at least, Q squared divided by 2C um, plus uh, 1 half uh, L I squared. Okay, and I'm going to have Q represent just the maximum charge on the capacitor, basically the initial charge that was on the capacitor. And I'm going to have capital I represent uh, the maximum current that flows through the system. All right? And we're going to investigate how this how this stuff works, basically. But I can give you a general picture of how it's going to work. I showed you guys yesterday with this little uh, applet right here, and we'll look at it again. When charge is stored on this uh, capacitor right here, it's in a tense state. And when you close the switch, the current has to start flowing, and that's what we see in this picture right here. That current, normally, without the inductor, if there was no inductor and you just attached a wire between the two plates of a capacitor, what would happen? It would it would do what? I take a capacitor that's charged and I, I place a wire between the both ends, what would happen to the capacitor? You queued your Mac and you said something, I think you said discharge. Yeah, it would discharge it, right? You'd basically just... what the, the charges would flow around to the other thing. And that's also what's going to happen here, too. Eventually, there will be no charges on that capacitor, right? And at that time, there's going to be some current flowing in the circuit. The thing is that that current will basically continue to flow in the same direction because of the inductor. At that moment, there's a magnetic field in the inductor, and it takes time for that magnetic field to decay. It won't decay instantly. So while that magnetic field is decaying, the current continues to flow. And as a result, after some time has passed, this plate that was originally negative is now going to be positive. And that'll happen up until the, the capacitor just can't hold any more charges, at which point the current will actually bounce backwards off the capacitor and start flowing the other direction. And then the process repeats itself. Did that make sense to you guys? You start with charges, the charges try to flow, and then they try to stop flowing, but there's an inductor that makes them keep the charges flowing, the current keeps flowing. They basically, the charges basically have a little more kinetic energy than they normally would because the inductor's here. And as a result, they keep piling up until the charges flip on the full plates. Until you have the right plate be positive, and then it repeats itself. You know, then this plate discharges and pushes the current backwards until the other plate charges positive. And it's basically like this. You go, this plate's positive, and then it's negative. And positive and negative, positive and negative, positive and negative. And the current goes from maximum current to zero current to max current to zero current, etc. It's just like a pendulum swinging back and forth. It's just like a simple harmonic oscillator. That's what we're going to compare it to here in a second. Hopefully that made some kind of sense. And I'll show you a demonstration of it here in a second. In fact, why don't we just do that part here? For anyone that wasn't didn't happen to be here last time. Let's make this a little bit smaller. So this is our circuit. It's just going to be a... Um, Our circuit is just going to be a capacitor and an inductor. So the inductor is this coil of wire. The capacitor is this thing right here. Oops. This wire. Go up here. Now we need to charge it. Can I just charge it? No. I have to use a battery to charge it. So we'll do that. That doesn't exactly work. This is not, okay, I need to get a wire here, and I need to get a wire here, and I'm going to need a switch so I can turn off the battery if I want to. Alright, 
So we'll throw the switch, and then we're going to open the switch. So this is what happens. Uh, it's not going super fast right now, but one plate fills up with positive charges. I don't want to show electrons. Can I make it... Uh, there's a button, I think. Also, what I want to do here, I want to do a current chart too. Let's do that. Um, there's a way to not show these little balls. I want to show, I don't want to show electrons. I want to show charge carriers. I don't immediately see, oh, advanced maybe? Hide electrons? I don't want to do that really. I want to show the direction of the current at the very least. Okay, we'll just use electrons. We just look at the, the negative charge flow. Zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Okay, there we go. Look at what it looks like. That probably looks like a curve you've seen before, obviously. It's like a perfect sine wave, right? Sine wave, cosine wave. It's a sinusoidal oscillation, right? But what's happening here is, you know, one plate fills up with negative charges until it can't hold any more electrons, and then those electrons push back, and then eventually there's no charge on here, but you've got current flowing that flows around until this plate fills up, and the process just goes back and forth and back and forth, effectively forever in this case. Not really, but that's an LC circuit, and it's oscillating back and forth. And you can see if you plot the current that it's this nice sinusoidal uh, pattern here. We can even speed it up, but before we learn about how we can speed it up, let's come over here. Maybe you can guess. Maybe you start thinking, how can I make this go faster? What do you guys think? What can I do to make it go faster? What can I make it so that the frequency, right now you can see this is a very gradual frequency, right? What could I do to make the frequency of this curve go faster? Any ideas? You want to lower the inductance? What about what can I do? What can I do with the capacitance? Should I increase it or decrease it? All right, think about that. Like, what would what would make this? And then we're going to do a derivation here. We'll figure out what that's based on. Okay, so the energy stored at any moment in time is given by this expression. This is the energy in the capacitor. This is the energy in the inductor. So. What I'd like to do now is to look at this expression by investigating kind of the time rate of change, Oops. to investigate the time rate of change of these quantities. And let's assume that the energy of our system remains constant, so that when I take the derivative of the left side, du dt, we're going to say that this is equal to zero. The energy is constant, basically, is what we're saying. There's no way for energy to get out of the system, even though that's actually untrue. Um, and then over here, we'll say we take the time derivative of this. So we're doing, I'll do this in more steps, I guess. DDT of Q squared over 2C uh, plus, and then DDT of this, 1 half LI squared. So we get 0 equals. What do you do when you take the derivative of this expression right here? What's that going to become? You're going to get a Q over C. Anything else? If I take the derivative, is that it? Is it Q over C? What do you guys think? Those of you who have taken calculus, does that look like, is there any other way this might change? What else can I put on here for this derivative? There's something missing. Do you guys know what it is? DQ? What's DQ? You're on the right track. They're close. That helps. Suppose I gave you a function, right? And I say the function is something like, I don't know, like this. And then I say, okay, now I've got an expression. Um, and I say the expression is something like, I don't know, some constant is equal to uh, x squared. 
Oh god, why does it always do that when I just... I want just an equal sign. I say some constant is equal to x squared, right? And then I ask you, what's dc dt equal to? What would it be? It'd be 2x times what? You learned this in Calc 1, I promise you. Yeah, exactly. Now, you could have, we could have just plugged in 8t squared in for x if we wanted to, but if we don't know what x is to begin with, we can't do that, right? So over here, I took ddt of q squared over 2c, but I'm saying q is basically the charge on the capacitor at a moment in time, basically. This is like at time t or something like this. q represents the charge. So effectively, q is a function of time. And this is one of the things we're going to try to figure out here. And also, the current in the system is a function of time, right? So when I take this derivative right here, I also need to put on it dq dt, right? I think they call this implicit differentiation or something like that. I don't know what it is. I call it the chain rule. You're basically just doing the chain rule, right? The derivative of the outside is, is q over c. The derivative of the inside is dq dt. You don't know what q is yet, but it varies in time. Um, the derivative of this one, can you guys, what would this one be then? It's pretty similar, right? Derivative of the outside is li. Derivative of the inside function i is just di dt, right? But we know that, oh, we're doing that thing again where I can't click. I figured some way to do this, actually. Do like that and change the color, maybe? And click something else? Oh, yeah, it's not doing it. I don't know why it does this. All right, well, we'll just pick colors. So if I look at uh, this expression right here, one thing we can say is that we know that the, the charge Q, um, if I take the time derivative of that, dQ dt, that that's equal to the current I. Sorry, that looks really bad. I don't even know why I drew that line right there. If I take um, the time derivative of the charge, that gives me the current, just like time derivative of position gives you velocity. And if I take, uh, yeah, so we can we can make some replacements inside of our equation right here. I'm gonna rearrange it. Well, we'll do it like this, zero. Oh, because I have to, all right. Okay, so this becomes uh, Q over C, it stays the same. Oh no, I changed thicknesses, didn't I? I did not mean to do that. I apologize, guys. I'm... Ooh, that's too thick. I guess it was this one I was using. Alright. Um, so we get Q over C. DQ DT. Um, plus L. I is the same thing as DQ DT. And then DI DT would be the second derivative. DQ DT2. Have you guys ever looked at, have you guys ever, um, I'll talk about that later, it doesn't really matter. All right, so uh, this expression, we notice that there's the same dq dt in two terms, so we can get rid of it, basically cancel it out, um, and then we can rearrange the expression like this. So now it's going to say, I'm going to write it like this, negative q divided by l times c is equal to d2, d2q dt2. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say let 1 over lc be equal to omega squared so that my expression becomes negative omega squared times q is equal to the second derivative of that function, q. This function represents uh, the charge stored on the uh, capacitor. This is a differential, differential equation. It's like the simplest type of differential equation there is. What's the solution to this equation? It says that I have some function q, I take the derivative twice of that function, and I get the function back, the same function, and it's multiplied by some constant squared. Okay, this is a constant here, right? What function satisfies that? You take the derivative twice, you get the same function back, multiplied by a constant, and a negative sign, which is important. So 
Certainly you guys know. I know some of you guys know. Don't be shy. What's the solution to this? It's the simplest of all differential equations. Something you did in Physics 1A2. Whether you remember it or not, I know you guys study a lot of different things. You can try some functions if you want to. You can try t squared. Does that work? If you put q of t equal to t squared and plug into this, uh, take the derivative twice. It's too much. Anyone out there? Any guesses? Are you guys lost? Do you want a hint? Do you want to try? Do you want to interact in some way? Are you guys even looking at your screen? Is my mic on? What do you guys got? Please give it a shot. Think about it. I can give you five minutes and step away if you want. I want you to look up on the internet. I want you to use your brain and think about, like, what is a function that when you take the derivative twice, you get the same function back with a negative sign? You don't even know that many functions. Like, you don't even know that many functions. Look at your calculator. I'll give you five minutes and come back.
right? So you guys said sine of t. Did you did you try to use it? Did you try to plug it into the equation and see if it works? It's not going to work. It's close. The equation says you take the function you pick. The plug sine of t in here. Try it. Any of you. All of you. And see if it works. It'll get close to working, but you're never going to get an omega out of there because the function you gave me doesn't have an omega in it. Whatever the function has, it has to have an omega. Omega is just a constant. That's all it is. It's just a number. You can set it equal to 3 if you want to, if that makes you feel better. But regardless, I would like to see more of you trying to interact and type something in the chat. I see three people typing. Like, what is a fun This is just a math question. What is a function that fits into here? Yeah, I muted myself. That's the solution. So 3t sine omega t is close. Yep. You can also have some kind of a phase constant on the outside. And you can also have uh, the maximum charge out here. That represents the charge on the capacitor in a moment in time. It's given by this expression right here, basically. Does that make sense to you guys? You can test it for yourself that if you plug this function in for q, you take the derivative twice, it will absolutely satisfy this differential equation. So that represents the charge as a function of time in the system. If you want to take the derivative of this, you can find the current as a function of time. The current as a function of time is just going to be omega times a negative sign times q multiplied by the cosine of omega t plus phi. Again, phi is just a phase shift. It's not really that important. It just means that you can shift the, the, the beginning you know, things uh, back and forth. Um, and then this thing right here, omega times q, would end up representing the maximum current in the circuit. I know this shows up in some of your guys' homework questions. The biggest thing that comes out of this, though, the piece that we're going to use for what we're going to do for the rest of class, or by looking at that other thing, is that the frequency of the oscillations within the circuit is given by this. You take 1 over the square root of L times C, and this gives you the frequency of the oscillations of the charge and the, and the current in the circuit. one over the square root of L times C. You said earlier, if you wanted to make things faster, you can make L smaller. That's right. You could also make the capacitance smaller and it would increase the frequency. And we'll see that if we look over here real quick. So if we pull, where is it? This guy up. And now, here, can I just, let's see. If I split this junction and then just reconnect it there, will that fix it? I just want to get these out of the way. Wait till it's fully charged. There we go. Remove, remove, remove. Okay, so there's our oscillation. It's oscillating back and forth. If we show the values on these things, that one's kind of hard to see. This one says 0.1 farads and it says 50 henrys, right? If you plug that into this expression, what would you get? Uh, 0.1 times 50 would be 5. 1 over the square root of 5. What is that? Like something like a half maybe or something like that? But if we change what these things are, 0.44. So 0.44 would represent the number of radians per second. You could divide that by 2 pi to get the number of like oscillations per second, or the frequency, the rate of yeah oscillations per second. Um, now if we change either of these, 
Like we make them both really small, make that one 0.05, let's say. And we make this one smaller as well, like 10. It should start oscillating back and back and forth faster, which it kind of is. And you can immediately see it on the frequency chart of the graph, right? The graph is more squished together now because it's oscillating back and forth more quickly. Anyway, that's an LC circuit. Those are the oscillations in the LC circuit. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. So I've got a little picture down here, much lower than I thought I was going to need it. This is a much better schematic of what's happening in the system than I can probably draw. This is from, it's not your textbook, it's from another textbook. So this is how we started off. We started off with a circuit where we have a capacitor right here. That's what this is right here. You've got a capacitor. Uh, it's charged on one side with some charge that's called Q max. At that moment in time, there's no current flowing through the circuit. And over here, we have a bar chart that indicates the amount of energy stored in the inductor, the energy stored in the capacitor, and the total energy. The total energy remains constant. Uh, we start off with all the energy in the capacitor right here. Um, the fact that there's charges stored here causes current to flow this way. At some moment in time, which is about a quarter cycle later, you're going to have all of the energy here stored up in the inductor. We can say that if we described these as occurring at different times, that this one would occur at a time that would be equal to zero. This one would occur one uh, quarter of a cycle later. If we represent capital T to represent the period for the oscillation, uh, the period for the oscillation is related to the angular frequency as, what is it, 2 pi divided by t is equal to omega, or 2 pi over omega is equal to t. The period is the time for one oscillation. So if this is the first time when the capacitor is uncharged, this is the kind of language you're going to see show up in your homework, the first time at which the capacitor is uncharged is a quarter cycle later. The time at which the capacitor is charged again is going to be half of a cycle later, and then this will be at 3t over 4. And this is some point in between. Uh, after 3t over 4, you go back to here. So this would repeat itself at a total period of t. And then this would be 5t over 4, etc. I'm not going to write that part, though. So at the moment in time, a quarter cycle later, the current flows in the circuit. You have all of the charge. All the current is, is making energy stored up in the inductor. That inductor then says, OK, I don't want the current to decrease. And so it makes the current keep going until the current flows up and charges this side. And then that process repeats itself every quarter cycle. This is very, very similar to the way in which a spring and a mass work in the sense that you start off with a mass that has a velocity of zero and you stretch it by some amount where the amount that the string is stretched, x, is related to the charge that's stored on the capacitor. When you let it go, it passes back through the equilibrium position where the spring is no longer compressed. The spring not being compressed is equivalent to no charges being on the capacitor. At that point, this object has kinetic energy and momentum that carries it to compress the spring to here. At that point, you have the spring compressed to negative the amplitude, which is why the polarity of these things change. So this is like positive amplitude. This is like negative amplitude and positive negative. You look at one plate. And then, yeah, that whole process basically just continues to repeat itself. And that's an LC circuit. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. There would, and we can see that with this right here. Let's wait until this thing is completely charged, or let's actually charge this back up again. Oops. So if I add into my system a resistor, it's not very charged anymore, is it here? Let's charge it up again. And then let's just split that junction. That should work, right? So now if I add a resistor into here, you can see it's going really fast now. And it has much bigger peaks because uh, it had a larger energy store at the beginning. Um, it's really nice visual of the way those things fill up. You see how it's acting like a spring? The charges basically just like go in and then they bounce off. So if I add into the system, what would I need to add into the system to make it so that it loses energy over time? Which one of these devices here would cause it to lose energy over time? Yep, so if we put a light bulb in here, it's going to dissipate the energy of the system, right? And you can notice, like, over time, the light bulb is going to get less and less dim, and, like, look at what happens to the curve. It kind of dissipates out. This is what we call an RLC circuit. 
an RLC circuit is one where the way that the, you know, a second ago we saw that for an LC circuit, right, our charge as a function of time was a sine wave, right? Um, it does something like this. If I have a circuit that has a resistor in it as well, then what's going to happen is you're still going to have that type of motion, but what's going to happen is like there's going to be this this decay of the current over time, like a sinusoidal, not a sinus, uh, like an exponential decay. And now the current is basically going to kind of slowly over time just decay out. This would be charged as a function of time. And that happens as a result of the fact that some of the energy is kind of like being going into the light bulb, into the resistor, or into the environment. One thing I'm leaving out here is that the acceleration of charges on the circuit also does other things that we'll talk about later, but it's more complicated. It's for a couple weeks from now. Does that all make sense to you guys? Does anyone have any questions?